Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan M.S. Pierce. Ukraine War News Update, second part there of the 1st of October 2024. This is a geopolitics video. Uh, I'm going to do a live stream in a short while, actually about an hour and a half uh, as I speak, with a poll, polling and voting expert who has his own uh, channel called Voting Trends. I'm going to have a chat to him about the US election and polls in general and what his thoughts are on all sorts of stuff. So please tune into that. Mm. But for the time being, let's go to geopolitics. I'm going to start with <clears throat> this growing uh, sense I get that, and I think it, it came with a victory plan, which I said was possibly the beginning of the end of this conflict. Now, that beginning, that end could be a really protracted end. Uh, it could be, it could take a year, two years, three years. I don't know. But we're getting to a point where some international entities are perhaps pressuring Zelensky to kind of wrap this up somehow but still in a way that is beneficial to Ukraine if they're allied to Ukraine if they're not allied to Ukraine then the pressure is to wrap it up as soon as possible and that is either intentionally or by natural collateral going to benefit Russia so if you, if you force both players to the negotiation table right now then Russia will be in the power position still. I think it's changing now, and I think there is a screw turning. It's been a long time coming. I've often talked about a screw turning, but it just takes a long time for these effects to come about. I think economically, Russia are in increasing troubles. I think demographically, they're in, uh, well, there are long-term issues with the Russian demographics, as there are in many countries, but particularly uh, acute in, in Russia since they've they've had so many people leaving the country. Uh, they've got that labour shortage, economic issues as a result of those demographic issues, so that they're saying basically they're outlawing ch ch the ideology of childlessness. It's like Gilead 2.0, or maybe you could argue 1.0, the real one. Um so I, I, I think there are issues with uh, their military production and uh, equipment, uh, personnel, um, etc, etc. And so if Ukraine were provided with the right equipment, then they could really put the pre and the ability to use that equipment where they want, they would be able to put some serious pressure on Russia and start to be in the ascendancy in terms of how you... Uh, or what you can get from any kind of negotiations. Now, no reports says, drawing from a Financial Times article that reports multiple European diplomats who attended last week's UN General Assembly in New York observed a notable shift in discussions regarding a potential settlement of the war in Ukraine. According to the Financial Times, Ukrainian officials reportedly demonstrated increased openness to discussing a ceasefire, even when Russian troop, even with Russian troops still on Ukrainian territory, Western officials engaged in more candid uh, conversations about the urgency of reaching a deal. Ukraine's new foreign minister, Andriy Sibiha, during private meetings on the first post in the US, on his first post in the US, adopted a more pragmatic approach to potential land for security negotiations, apparently, indicating a willingness to explore compromise solutions, contrasting with the stance of his predecessor. Now, the problem is, if this is true, you don't want this getting out. I mean, it's out now. There's a Financial Times article, so Russia know about this. But you don't want this getting out because it then gives ammunition for Russia in terms of their negotiations. They then start thinking. But then the question is, do Russia want negotiations at the moment? They are way short of any maximalist intentions they had for Ukraine. In fact, it's impossible, as I said in, in an article that I wrote right at the beginning of the war, they 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 cannot win. Russia cannot win, but it's whether Ukraine can prevail. And the most likely outcome is some kind of suboptimal situation for both countries. And I think, and I, and I still think that's probably likely what you're going to get. I think it's going to be very um, unlikely that Ukraine are going to be able to shift, and certainly militarily, they're not going to be able to shift Russia out of the uh, the land that they've occupied since 2014. The, the the only chance of that is some kind of regime collapse in Russia, which is possible, right? It, it whether it's plausible, whether it's probable, I don't know. Uh, there there are so many variables, but but that's the only real option I think for Russia's military presence to be completely evacuated from Ukraine, and so therefore there there just 
will it will come down to some kind of negotiation and the problem is that that already that benefits russia in terms of territory and being able to flex locally as in geographically locally and and be able to take territory and then get away with keeping it that's a problem here what you'd want to do is make russia pay a price for that in terms of what you you will still be sanctioned ad infinitum or for a long time or whatever but the problem is you then have governments that are getting into power say austria so you now got austria serbia slovakia hungary who are pro russia you've got Vox in Spain waiting in the wings. You've got AFD in Germany waiting in the wings. You've got Giorgio Maloney holding off uh, Matteo Salvini and La Liga and other pro-Russian sentiments in Italy. You've got Trump in, in the US, uh, who, as far as I'm concerned, is basically a uh, under the influence, sphere of influence of Russia. And so there, there are chances that sanctions might get lifted. You've got the Austrian a premier that's just got in saying, or his party, he, he's got in saying that um, that sanctions should be lifted to Russia. So you've got an awful lot of options for for Russia within the European Union, within the larger Europe, uh, if you include the, like the Balkans, and then, of course, Trump in the US. So, yeah, I, it's it's a very delicate time in terms of the war in Ukraine and, and the diplomacy that concerns it and in light of that you've got russia continuing to saber rattle now something i haven't reported on that i really should have is the change in doctrine so just over the last week or so russia has formally changed their nuclear doctrine which has been a form of saber rattling to effectively f do a bit of a nuke flex Here's a, here's a piece in the Kiev Independent that we'll read. Opinion is an opinion piece. Is Russia's new nuclear doctrine a game of bluff or a shift in strategy? Putin's recent nuclear threats tied to a proposed change in Russia's military doctrine are aimed at intimidating Ukraine's foreign backers, but represent more psychological warfare than a shift in actual policy. Okay, Russian President Vladimir Putin announced a seemingly significant modification of Russia's military doctrine on September the 25th. He revealed that the new doctrine would propose considering aggression against Russia by a non-nuclear state, quote, with the participation or support of a nuclear state, as a joint attack on Russia. Putin's message to the West is clear. If you help Ukraine militarily, you, we may also target you. The Russian president further explained that the new doctrine will, quote, clearly set the conditions for Russia to transition to using nuclear weapons. We, quote, we will consider such a possibility of nuclear retaliation that when we receive reliable information about a massive launch of air and space attacks and them crossing our state border, Putin warned darkly, citing, quote, strategic and tactical aircraft, cruise missiles, drones and hypersonic and other flying vehicles. He clarified that the changes apply to both Russia and Belarus, because, of course, we know that Belarus is part of Russia part of the Russian Federation. Um, what makes this threat different from Putin's earlier ones is not its boldness, but that it concerns a forthcoming formal document. Despite this, Putin's announcements do not fundamentally alter Russia's position. The pre-announced changes to Russia's military doctrine are as much a psychological operation by the Kremlin as previous nuclear intimidations. As with the past threats, Moscow aims to scare away foreign supporters of Ukraine from committing and expanding their aid. The proposed change to military doctrine is another attempt to curtail Western assistance to Ukraine. And just to finish off here, it's not it's not particularly long. Oh, uh, there is quite a bit more, actually. Uh, but I, I think this is really important to go through. However, it's important to put Putin's statement in context. Official Russian official texts, whether laws, doctrines or treaties, carry little weight in a country where there is no rule of law and state behaviour is marked by arbitrariness. As in domestic affairs, Kremlin decisions are based on political preferences with legal acts being adapted, interpreted or amended as needed. Putin's latest threats are linked to an ongoing strategic debate in the West. One critical discussion is whether to provide Ukraine with more advanced weaponry, including Germany's highly effective yet now notorious Taurus cruise missile. Another debate concerns allowing Ukraine to use Western missiles inside Russia. The latter, in particular, seems to be a source of concern for the Kremlin. These issues must be viewed in a broader historical context. For more than two years, Ukraine has attacked Russian military targets in Crimea, Luhansk, Zaporizhia and Kherson Oblasts, territories Russia considers its own following the illegal annexations of 2014 and 2022, as well as respective changes in Russian constitution. So just to let you know that Russia is being, and the West, actually, if you believe 
that Russia believe what they say, then the West is is being inconsistent here because striking deep into Russia, say into Belgorod, like deep into Belgorod or into another oblast behind that with eight Atakums, is is the, according to Russia themselves and their constitution the same as using eight Atakums in Luhansk, Donetsk, Crimea, Zaporizhia, and Kherson oblasts, because. Russia has adopted them into their constitution so that they are Russia. So deep into Russia is what is already taking place. Any strike on Crimea is a strike deep into Russia. So you can go at least as far as those uh, as the 1991 borders of Ukraine in terms of shooting into Russia with eight Atakums, because that's what they do already. So this is really weird um, contradiction that I think both sides allow for. You know, you, you it, the West has to say, well, hang on, you've just told it, you literally written in your constitution that this is Ukraine, and you haven't escalated with Ukrainians using eight Atakums there, so why would you escalate if we just, instead of shooting into Crimea, we're shooting them into, or Ukraine is shooting them into Belgorod? 200 kilometers. What is the difference? These issues must be viewed in their broader his historical context. For more than two years, Ukraine has attacked Russian... Oh, I've already said that. Uh, more recently, Ukraine has also targeted military and industrial, industrial sites within Russia's undisputed territory, including a drone attack on the Kremlin. Some of these strikes, particularly those on large ammunition depots, deep inside Russia have been notably successful. Russia's current military doctrine allow already allows the use of nuclear weapons in response to conventional attacks since 2010 the doctrine has permitted nuclear retaliation if the state's existence is threatened by conventional weapons this provision was reaffirmed in the 2020 foundations of state policy for the of the russian federation in the area of nuclear deterrence given ukraine's repeated attacks on russian territory moscow could have invoked this doctrine long ago as justification for a nuclear response since 2014 Putin and his associates have report, repeatedly signalled their willingness to use nukes in response to Western-supported Ukrainian resistance against Russia's territorial expansion using conventional weaponry. The phrase, quote, the very existence of the Russian state could be interpreted to encompass the inviolability of its borders and the security of its airspace, including the annexed Ukrainian territories that Moscow now views as part of, of Russia. Ukraine strikes and incursions into legitimate and illegally held Russian territory since 2022 could also have been viewed by the Kremlin as justification for retaliation with weapons of mass destruction. In other words, what Ukraine has already done in striking Crimea and invading Kursk is enough technically, according to their doctrine, for Russia to have used nukes, but they haven't. So will these other changes, such as the ability to fire ATACMS a little bit further, really get Russia to invoke their nuclear doctrine? Um, however, no nuclear weapons have been used. It, the article continues and ends. Uh, this is because Russian threats, whether verbal or written, are not previews of actual actions. They are part of the psychological warfare campaign you, aimed at undermining Ukraine's defence. Putin's recent announcement of changes to Russia's military doctrine is just another move in a high-stakes PR game. Agreed from me. Uh, a decision to use nukes would be driven more by political calculations and by doctrinal documents. If the Kremlin believes that using such weapons would enhance its power, it may act regardless of the specific wording in official text. Political utility, rather than legal obligation, will guide Moscow's choices, and that's for sure. This means, first, that an escalation against NATO remains unlikely as long as Moscow believes in the seriousness of the alliance's mutual defence commitments. Second, Western and other governments must make it clear to the Kremlin that using nuclear weapons in Ukraine will have severe consequences. To prevent nuclear escalation, world leaders should send an unequivocal message to Moscow. Further escalation of Russia's genocidal war on Ukraine will not go unpunished. Putin's threats must be met with a resounding global rejection. Now, as far as I understand it, those threats have been made. So that last paragraph is a little bit off for me because I'm under the impression that very early on in the war, the US or NATO said to Russia something along the lines of a bit of speculation here. But if you use nukes, we will absolutely smash you with conventional warfare. We, we won't escalate with nukes. We will just, for example, one of the theories is that, that NATO would just wipe out the Arctic fleet just like that. So you put the power of all those 30 odd NATO countries together and you could wreak havoc on the Russian um, Russian Navy.
just completely destroy their navy. And he's, so Russia know this. And the US know that Russia know this. And yet still they are afraid that Russia will make that decision to use nukes. And I don't think that is, that is, I mean, you can justify it conceptually, but I ju just don't think it's probable at all. Now, in terms of peace and negotiations, uh, another thing I haven't spoken too much about is the Brazilian and Chinese peace, in peace initiative, which as far as I understand it, doesn't even require Russia to remove their troops from Ukraine, right? So this is basically China and Brazil getting together and doing uh, doing a, a solid one for Russia. Orban, Viktor Orban, the Hungarian dictator wannabe, held intensive talks with China and Brazil to initiate the peace summit between Ukraine and Russia. The EU leadership has already been irritated by Orban's trips before the summer vacation. We know where Orban is at here, and he is just peddling pro-Russian um narratives and diplomacy. Now, Jens Stoltenberg, who is now, I think, pretty much today being replaced by Mark Rutte as the Secretary General of NATO, said that NATO should support Ukraine's peace plan and not China's. So this is very good rhetoric. We, we need to be very strong in repudiating these kind of pro-Russian appeasement peace narratives and, and uh, projects. New Chinese-led peace initiative for Ukraine attracted support from 17 countries, including, and get this, NATO member Turkey. Because, uh, of course, Turkey wants to join BRICS. And I know people laugh about BRICS and, you know, what can BRICS do? It's not about what BRICS is now. It's about what BRICS might be in 100 years, 50 years. And if you've got Turkey turning away from NATO, turning away from the EU and saying we want to, they've now said they want to join BRICS and you've got them coming on board with a peace initiative for Ukraine, you are starting to get people taking sides here that you would rather them not take that particular side. That's an unexpected one because you are in the US, EU and NATO sphere of influence. But because Turkey wanted to join NATO, uh, the EU, they didn't really have the... Uh, they didn't really check off any of the things they needed to join the EU, such as freedom of press, so on and so forth. Uh, they've kind of moved away from this idea, and Erdogan has become all the more dictatorial, I think, in many aspects of his rule. Uh, he seems to be someone that's going to rule forever, by the looks of it. Um, and he uh, he seems to be sort of at the helm of Turkey and allowing Turkey to drift more and more towards the east and towards Russia and China. Um, okay, and now talking about peace initiatives, we've then got Trump's peace plan, or at least a peace plan suggested by Trump, either appointees or people in his circle. So Kellogg and Fleiss are people who have um, um, come up with a plan to for Trump to um, bring about peace between Russia and Ukraine. Now, you've got H.R. McMaster, who is a former Trump appointee, uh, saying that, uh, you know, he was, what was he, um, national security advisor to Donald Trump. So the article here in Kiev Independent is a real myth. Trump's Ukraine peace plan rubbished by former national security advisor. So uh, former national security advisor to Donald Trump has rubbished the Republican presidential candidate's claims that he will be able to broker a peace deal between Kiev and Moscow and end the war in Ukraine. Speaking to CBS's Face the Nation, H.R. McMaster dismissed his former boss's claims as, quote, a real myth, adding, it's a real misunderstanding of war to assume that you can get a favourable political outcome without a favourable military outcome. So this is so freaking important. And this is what we we're talking the other day about. Who was it that said the battlefield is part of the negotiating table, right? You do your negotiating on the battlefield. And then when you get to the table, you've got your position to be able and leverage to be able to say, well, look, this is where we're, we're at. This is what we've achieved. This is how screwed you are. Let's do peace now and see where it ends up. Each side is vying to get as much success as they can on a battlefield because these are the preliminary stages of the negotiations. It's all part of the negotiation, right? As McMaster says, that's never really happened in war, um, assuming you can get a favourable political outcome without a favourable mil military outcome. So he he's what what he is saying is that Trump is expecting, uh, and you could say the same about 
or ban and anyone that, that wants this peace plan, a peace plan to go ahead straight away, they're expecting Ukraine to be able to get a favorable political outcome without a favorable military outcome. You can't, you won't do it. You know, for, for example, go back two years, go back to March 2022 and then and then imagine what would have happened if they were forced to go to the negotiation negotiating table at that point. Now, I was watching the Zelensky story, BBC, uh, excellent BBC documentary. And in that, there was this fascinating interchange between exchange between um, Emmanuel Macron on the telephone with Zelensky. And basically, they were going to go for... He was, like, desperate for a negotiation at that point. This was, like, early doors, like, days after the invasion started, right? Where they were thinking, well, we're done for, clearly done for. But Russia made a bunch of mistakes. It all went a bit wrong for them. And people started helping Ukraine more as they saw Ukraine were able to withstand the Russians. And history, you know, the rest was history, right? But... At that point, there was there was the potential for negotiations to have taken place. Now, with Russia in butcher, having done a butcher massacre on the doors of Kiev, imagine the deal that would have been done then. Imagine what Russia would have taken off Ukraine. They had had the military success in just invading and just moving all their stuff in. Ukraine have now pushed back and we've got to a positional point in the war. But if Ukraine can gain any further successes on the battlefield or by striking deep into Russia in a targeted way, then that will translate to greater success at the negotiating table. And I think just imagining what would have happened in 2022 gives you a sense of that. Um, the article continues, Trump has promised to end Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine within a day, of course, if elected, but has not publicly elaborated on how he plans to achieve that. One plan reportedly involves ceding territory to Russia. Even the Kremlin has voiced skepticism in Trump's claim, saying on July the 18th that there, there was a need to be realistic. I don't really buy it, McMaster said, adding that uh, the only way that Ukraine can end up with a favourable settlement is to ensure that Putin is in a situation where he's convinced that he's losing the war. I wholeheartedly agree to this, and I'm sure most of you will. Um, how do you do that? You demonstrate our resolve to continue to support the Ukrainians as they defend themselves against the continued onslaught by the Russians, McMaster said. That's how you get to maybe favourable conditions for negotiation. In July, Zelensky told, said Trump should tr reveal his plan so Kiev could can be prepared for any risks such a, a plan might entail. Quote, if Trump knows how to finish his war, he should tell us today, Zelensky told Bloomberg Television in an interview on July the 3rd. If there are risks to Ukrainian independence, if we lose statehood, we want to be ready for this. We want to know. We want to understand whether in November we will have the powerful support of the US or we'll be all alone. Trump and Zelensky met in the US last week uh, where the presidential candidate said that he had learned a lot as the war continues to be noted, uh, continues, but noted that his views on ending it as soon as possible have not changed. Um, and he's obviously been re recently very critical of Zelensky, etc., etc. Now, in light of Trump's view on peace, this this kind of depressed me, right? So, in Poland, you have Andrzej Duda, who is a member of the PIS, the Law and Justice Party, that was previously in um, previously ruling in Poland. They are a right wing populist party. Who and I know that Talaria will disagree with me on this, but my opinion is that you'd had democratic backsliding since they were in power, as according to uh, Transparency International, actually I think, um, uh, where whereby uh, you had the or was it Reporters Without Borders? Uh, you've got the judiciary had been um, somewhat manipulated, and the press and so on and so forth. Anyway. The situation is that you then had an election whereby the Law and Justice Party, although they got the largest, I think, share of the vote, their dr vote share dropped dramatically and they, they weren't able to form a coalition to form a government. And Donald Tusk, the former um, European parliamentarian, uh, is, is now formed a coalition. It was very, both parties are pro Ukraine, but Law and Justice Party is basically like MAGA Republicanism to a degree, right? So, if you imagine 
you took like a, a, a Trump Republicanism and had it in Poland, but had the geographical and historical connections to Russia such that that kind of r rule was still anti-Russian in a way that Trump isn't. He doesn't have that history, even though the Cold War seems, seems to have bounced off him, bounced off his hair or something. It's different with Poland, and Poland differs actually from other nations around. So Hungary weirdly doesn't have this situation. Poland, on both sides of the aisle, unless you get to the, the far right called the Confederacy or Confederation, a confederation they are somewhat pro-russian or they are pro-russian but the law and justice party is anti-russian but very much aligned with trumpian republicanism so now andre duda has gone to the us and is going around the us and doing for example going on fox news here and he is being pro trump and this is i think troubling for ukraine Right, because I think Trump is not a good option for Ukraine, as I've told you a million times. Polish President Andrzej Duda has been going around Pennsylvania. So Pennsylvania has a big Polish population, eight hundred thousand, right? And they have been um the target of campaigns by the Harris administration or the Harris ca Harris tickets because you know the war in Ukraine will we'll talk to them a lot. However, Duda is basically saying to these Polish people Trump would be fine for uh, Ukraine, don't worry. Which I think goes against everything that we've heard from Trump and everything that we've heard from any uh, analysts, including the one, this opinion uh, piece in the, in, and H.R. McMaster and so on and so forth. Anyway, his endorsement is massive because millions of voters in the region have strong Polish roots. And of course, whoever wins Pennsylvania wins the election. Quote, we have about 10 million Poles living in the United States. It's an electoral value, so to speak. So I'm convincing them. I'm telling them this is Duda speaking. Listen, every one of you can vote in the United States and this has and, and has the right to vote. I urge you to vote in the election. OK, all good so far. Then he goes on. Trump's presidency was very good for Poland. President Donald Trump understands the strategic importance of our country in Europe. He understands the situation of Central and Eastern European countries. Although I mean, he may have said more. I haven't listened to it, but like... Yeah, but he's not good for Ukraine, which is being conveniently, I think, uh, omitted there. Right. Uh, Russian disinformation campaign has been disclosed by the FBI uh, that they have argued that Twitter or X has become, quote, the only mass platform that could currently be utilized in the United States because it's the only one that didn't remove Russian created content. So we've started seeing TikTok remove content. We've started seeing other platforms remove content because of the sanctions that were put in place. And Twitter is the only one that hasn't. And I can tell you, just when you start looking at how the Hurricane Helene is being reported on Twitter, you have all sorts of, of really problematic things that have bots all over them. So anyway, there, there, there's a piece here by Thomas Ridd. Uh, the lies Russia tells itself, the country's propagandists target the West, but mislead the Kremlin too. Uh, but there is just, as we all know, a lot of Russian disinformation finding its uh, feet in the US. Now, Ukraine, as I've mentioned in the last two videos now, but this is, this is really the right place for it. Ukraine is becoming a political football in this uh, discussion of the hurricane. And this is Donald Trump Jr. saying maybe if North Carolina identified as Ukraine. So this is only not only just a, a dig at wokeism and identity politics. Maybe if North, North Carolina identified as Ukraine, some of its incredible people would actually get some attention, resources and much needed funding for themselves in their time of need. Now, the reality is that Joe Biden released FEMA funding and got things sorted before the hurricane even hit. He was that far ahead of the game. Now, what was it? Har Hurricane Matthew, was it? it? When Trump was in charge and Roy Cooper asked for funding, he got 1% of his funding. So Donald Trump literally has gone to Georgia and, and, and said, look at me, I'm here. I know here's 25 million quid and blah, blah, blah. And look, these guys are doing nothing when actually, and he's even lied. He's overtly lied and said, um, Brian Kemp, the governor of Georgia, he's not even had a phone call from 
um, from Biden when Brian Kemp's on camera saying, I've just had a phone call with Biden and he's promised me everything I need and it's great. Thank you so much for his support. So Brian Kemp has said, the government's doing everything they can. Thank you very much. Donald Trump is down the road saying, lying, lying to everyone and saying he's not even been phoned by, by Biden. They're not getting this. And at the same time, back during Hurricane Matthew, Roy Cooper, senator from, uh, no, governor of North Carolina, uh, asked for X amount of aid and got 1% of that aid. And there are people, I've seen some some videos of people saying, F Donald Trump, like people from actual North Carolina that, that went through that going, him, this is, but people on Twitter, they're all over this and saying, well, money's going to Ukraine. And it should have gone to these people because, of course, you know, they really need high Mars and they tackums right now to to um, to do this. Yeah, you know, here, uh, STFU, shut the F up. Uh, I remember when your father provided less than one percent of requested aid to eastern North Carolina after Hurricane Matthew. Yeah, it was Hurricane Matthew. Stop with your BS. Um, yeah. So uh, Hurricane Ravage Florida town raises Ukraine flag. So Congress will send aid again. This is a kind of meme that you're seeing around. So this is someone that's saying that they'll only get aid if, if they pretend to be Ukraine and they're not getting aid because all that money's gone to Ukraine. Here's another one. Um, it's just and and these will predominantly be well, there'll be a lot of bots. The Russian bots are all over this. You got Matt Gates here, so the Republican lawmaker from the House of Representatives, who is—I mean, goodness me—he's up on its own ethics investigation for sex trafficking and sex with minors. But putting that aside, Matt Gates is literally the worst. Says this person, "Dear Congress," said Matt Gates, on behalf of my fellow Florida man in grave need of assistance for the for the hurricane, just send us like half of what you sent Ukraine. Signed, your fellow Americans. So again, Ukraine being used as a political football here by American lawmakers. To which Representative Jerry Connolly said, we passed a bill on Friday that included $18.8 billion for FEMA's hurricane response. And every Florida Republican, including Matt Gates, voted no on it. So this is what's going on. You're being gaslighted. You're being like sold a lie as if these people really care and they don't care. And by the way, Project 2025 would get rid of FEMA and it get rid of what is it, Nora and and Hurricane Response and they get rid of the weather service. This is part of the Project 2025 blueprint. So you know, if you want help not to get to to places like North Carolina and Georgia and Florida in at times of of national crisis uh, due to natural disasters then you know by all means vote for these guys and vote for project 2025 someone else here saying when tragedy struck one candidate responded by staging a photo with a blank paper the other flew to the scene and donated 25 million dollars to vote accordingly of course she's actually doing the work so they said very clearly, they gave all the response, they gave the money, they got FEMA up and running. They say, we will not go there until we are asked to go there by the people because we don't want to get in in the way of actual responses and, and assistance going on. So if you have to have all the security trying to get to all these places where people are actually trying to help those on the ground and you've got dignitaries running about, you're concentrating more on their safety and their PR than you are on actually doing the help. So that's why they're not there. So this is just a massive political stunt, and I think it's fairly disgusting for being that. He's just using it as a political stunt, whereas Biden and Harris are actually, you know, trying to sort out the problem through through the government. Anyway, enough on that. But but Ukraine is being used as a political football. Uh, now, onto a different subject. European parts are still reaching Russian ships despite sanctions, according to the BBC. Sometimes I don't go to the original articles like the BBC. I prefer to go to the... I know they're piggybacking on the original articles, like Euromide and Press, Cube, Independent, etc., etc. But I just like to support the um, Ukrainian news sources. So that's why I do this. BBC investigation exposes shipments of parts for anti-sabotage boats and border patrol ships used by Russian military and security forces. Quote, Russia uses third countries like China, Turkey and Central Asian nations to bypass EU and US sanctions imposed for its aggression against Ukraine. In June, the EU introduced anti-circumvention measures, including compliance requirements for EU subsidiaries, due diligence uh, for battlefield goods sales and contractual controls on industrial know-how transfers. But unfortunately, there are, there are ways around this and uh, you know, Turkey and China, 
being complicit in the ability for Russia, uh, Russian military vessels to get their spare parts from Western um Western manufacturers. In September 2023, here's just one example, Danish manufacturer Grunfoss imported a ship pump worth $632 to Russia for these Border Patrol ships ordered by the Kronstadt, uh, Kronstadt Trade and Industry Association late in December 2023, equipment for a Project 22120 patrol ship. Also under FSB control was imported. This shipment included a pump from German company Alweiler and a compressor from Dutch firm Dino Compressors totaling $46,000. BBC reached out to the manufacturers mentioned in the report. Dino Compressors emphasised it had no contracts with the Kronstadt Group or their Chinese intermediary, uh, did not supply equipment to the Russian Navy and did not violate sanctions. Of course, I'd say that. Grunfoss stated that after 2022, it ceased all contacts with the Russian supplier and allocated additional resources to monitor sales and prevent re-export of their products to Russia, etc., etc. So it's still an issue. Good on the BBC for doing that. And this is why we should support... I said not supporting the BBC by not looking at theirs, but we should support investigative journalism. It's so important. Without that, people are not held to account. Uh, the G7 countries declared that they will never recognise uh, Russia's attempts to illegally annex parts of Ukraine. So this is really good news. Quote, we will never come to terms with the violations of international law committed by Russia against Ukraine, and we will strongly condemn its aggression. The statement reads, so the G7 remaining really strong. They called on the Russian Federation to adhere to the UN Charter. Yeah. And promised to continue comprehensive support for Ukraine. Excellent stuff. Now, this is super worrying, and this is exactly what I've been talking about for bloody ages. So, uh, let me have some tea. My thesis is that, and I believe this is part of, Ant I'm, I just read somewhere, this is part of Autocracy Inc., which is, I think, Anne Applebaum's new book, new book so I absolutely need to read that. It's all connected. It's all freaking connected, guys. So, I've talked about how Tucker Carlson is connected to Viktor Orban through his dad's uh, sitting on the board for a lobbying company who, and their major client is Viktor Orban. And you've got CPAC, the Conservative Conference and Heritage Foundation. And that's been CPAC's taken place. The American Conservative Conference has taken place twice in Budapest, I think. And then in, across uh, America with Hungarian influence, with Viktor Orban being there, Viktor Orban going to Mar-a-Lago at least twice now. In fact, happening on the campaign trail. So they were worried about Zelensky um, being involved with it with the campaign doing things pro uh, democrat meanwhile victor orban an actual you know, a leader of another country endorsing out openly endorsing donald trump and then going to mar a lago um and then acting as a go between between trump and putin arguably and so it's all connected so you've got you know heritage foundation being funded through the danube institute and the bethany foundation both uh hungarian organizations that take one of them's part of the propaganda arm they get funding from the propaganda arm of the hungarian government which gets its funding and influence from russia and so you've got russian influence going through to heritage foundation which then write the project 2025 900 page book that is a blueprint for the trump presidency so you've got influence from russia coming through um through orban and through hungary to conservative organizations in the US that that form the bed of a potential Trump uh, victory and administration. Compromised, hugely compromised by Russia here, uh, uh, eventually. But actually, this is happening all across Europe. So this, this, these, uh, yes, to some degree on the far left, like BSW, I think, in, in Germany, and maybe a couple of other places, but ostensibly the far right in, in, Europe is essentially under control of the Kremlin or is being massively funded and uh, supported by the Kremlin and their return on investment is staggeringly good. Russia are good at this. They shouldn't have bothered invading Ukraine. They should have just spent all that money on these kind of disinformation campaigns and, and projects to cause division in Europe and in the US. They're very good at that. So Another part of this, so when you're kind of making all these connections and we know that all of these, like whether it be, uh, um, you know, Vox in Spain or maybe La Liga in, in Italy, uh, whether it's Confederation in Poland, whether it's AFD and BSW in Germany, whether it's Marine Le Pen's uh, Rassemblement National in France, whether it's uh, FPO in Austria, Fidesz in Hungary, um, 
Smer and their even further to the right uh, coalition partners in Slovakia, whether it's Vucic in Serbia. These people are all connected. Here's an example. Wow, that was fast. Spain's far-right Vox Party admitted that it was indeed Orban linked MBH Bank Magyar Bank Holding, which financed their 2023 parliamentary and municipal election campaigns. Another case of Hungarian meddling in foreign elections. We have Hungary funding here the far right in Spain, and you can bet that that funding is probably going a step further back to Russia. And that is built on that it was the Orban linked bank that funded Marina Pen's campaign um, previously. Uh, suspected of funding now Vox's, uh, um, Spain's Vox party. It is just like, uh, the, well, this is just a, a big project. And so uh, I had a big rant. I, because you know how cool I am, right? I just do really nice, like, cat pictures and trick shots. That's what the sort of stuff I post on Facebook, right? No, this is the stuff I post on Facebook. I am very, very boring. I just had a big rant. So I'm going to read it to you. Some fun geopolitical facts for you, given the far right has just had massive success in the Austrian election, an uncomfortable shadow of the past. I tell my audience that so much uh, in international politics is connected, not least the rise of the far right across Europe. Uh, that is also reflected in the rise of Trump. Trump's best mate is Viktor Orban, the dictator wannabe whom Trump heaps praise on at every conceivable moment, including the recent debate. Orban's Hungarian regime is very closely connected to Russia and the Kremlin through financing and influence operations. The Orban-linked MBH Bank, Magyar Bank Holding, it turns out funded the far the French far-right Marine Le Pen's national rally campaign. And now we learn that it also funded Spain's far-right Vox Party, who have admitted that it was indeed the Orban-linked MBH bank that finance over uh, their 2023 parliamentary and municipal election campaigns, another case of Hungarian meddling in foreign elections, as we just read. It's all connected, which is what Steve Bannon was trying to do when he came over to from the US after leaving his position for Trump. The movement, that was what he, the, the organisation he has started. So Steve Bannon, the, the Trump, like, if you watch the old SNL sketches, he was a grim reaper standing behind Donald Trump when he was uh, president. The movement is a Brussels-based right-wing populist organisation founded by Steve Bannon to promote right-wing populism, populist and economic nationalist groups in Europe that are opposed to European Union governments and political structures of Europe. So these are there are networks of people working to destabilise Europe from the inside so that you get economic, uh, so you get populist governments with nationalist agendas trying to break up the EU. Who does that benefit? Well, it benefits Russia massively. And for the isolationist America, it benefits America if America is going to sink and not do, sink back into the shadows and not do alliances. They don't want a competitor in the EU. But the, then what happens is the EU gets superseded by a much bigger agglomeration of countries like BRICS, etc., etc. And so you'd much rather have the EU on your side as an alliance rather than... See, the problem is Trump sees everything as a competitor. He sees everyone as a competitor. He's transactional. This is what Madeleine Albright wrote about him in, in, in her book saying that, that he doesn't understand alliances so he doesn't get NATO and he doesn't get the EU he doesn't understand working with people for a positive sum game he uh, he sees everyone out there as a competitor so it's a zero sum game is is they do good we do bad so the only way we can do well is they do bad so we need to screw everyone else over so like the EU has to be taken apart and and blah 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 but i like dictators so you know they're all right um remember that uh, good a good old former Fox News bigger, a few typers there, and Elon Musk investment Tucker Carlson is spreading outright Russian propaganda along with Musk and managed to swing that interview with Putin. While it's worth knowing that Carlson's father sits on board on the board for uh, a lobbying organization whose main client is Viktor Orban, as I said earlier. Then there is a conservative organization, Heritage Foundation, authors of Project 2025, Trump's blueprint for office, which is funded by the Hungarian organizations, Danube Institute and the Bethany Foundation, uh, if I Call correctly, receiving money directly from the propaganda arm of the Hungarian government, which in, is in turn uh, influenced and financed to buy, uh, financed by the Kremlin. I need to sort out some typos here. Uh, CPAC, the US Conservative Conference, assisted uh, with heritage, has taken 
place in Budapest in Hungary twice, I believe. Uh, Orban has been a guest of honor at Trump's own residence a number of times, as well as attending CPAC conferences. I could go on ad nauseum. The connections between the Trump isolationist and anti-EU wing of the Republican Party and the Kremlin can be very easily mapped out. While immigration may or may not be a hu the huge issue in Europe that the far right maintain, it is certainly true that the growth of the far right movement in is being financed and driven by nefarious powers whose tendrils reach out either via Hungary uh, from or directly from Russia. A vote for Trump is a vote for Putin. A vote for Le Pen is a vote for Putin. A vote for Kickel, Fitzo, Orban, Wilders, Abascal, Van Grieken is a vote for Putin. In a bang for your buck evaluation, the Russian money spent on disinformation is the best money ever spent by any government in history in, history in terms of affecting foreign nations. Who needs guns and tanks and missiles when you have disinformation and political division? It's a really cheap way to screw over and manipulate the rest of the world. Scarily, half the population of these other countries seem to be well up for it. Ugh. So I'm going to have to get hold of the audiobook, I think, for Anne Applebaum's Autocracy Inc. Uh, anyway, moving on. Chancellor Olaf Scholz of Germany plans to have his first direct conversation with Putin in almost two years. Zeit reports referring to the government to government sources. A pro proposed phone call is expected to occur ahead of the G20 meeting in Brazil in November, although the request for the conversation has not yet been made. Interesting. Again, does that show a sign of moving into this the this latter stage of the war? So into the negotiation stage is that is that reflection there russia transports oil through the gulf of finland on unseaworthy tankers according to the finnish outlet Lie. Uh, according to the publication from january to may 2024 about 600 tankers with russian oil pass through the gulf of finland ha almost half of them 283 belong to the shadow fleet 11 of them are on the blacklist which is prohibited for use so that's worrying that that's still going on um, and russia is planning a 25.6 percent increase in its funding for what you ask and of course they are up in the funding for their defense uh so um is it, is it that no it's for the president putin and his presidential administration according to a draft budget for 2025 so a 25.6 percent increase in his budget interesting um i wonder if that's adjusted for inflation it'd be interesting if that's a sign of inflation then you might get a true sense of what inflation is yeah, we're increasing the budget by 26% because inflation is 26%. Actually, we're keeping it the same, really. Either way, uh, that's that's uh, a bit rubbish. Right, thank you very much for watching. Really appreciate your support. Uh, I do apologise about my kind of going off on, on one about... I, I, and I don't apologise. I am deeply, deeply concerned about the future of humanity. And I think the worst of humanity is coalescing around dangerous ideas um and i think something like immigration is so easily weaponized i mean we definitely need to get a handle on immigration or the perception of immigration or you know something needs to be done about the whole topic such that there aren't people who are so single-minded in their voting that they will vote for just whoever is going to do x with immigration because usually the people that are going to do x with immigration will have Y, Z, A, B, C, D, E, E, F, G, and all of those ones suck as part of their manifesto. So the desire to to be, to want something strong to be done on immigration almost invariably leads to other things that quite often are autocratic in nature or dictatorial in nature. And so, or fascistic in nature, nature, to be perfectly honest. And so we have this issue of immigration that is driving uh, and it's only going to get worse with with climate change and, and the pressures of, of Europe being wealthy and other parts of the world being less wealthy and that inequality and and the ease of travel we can move much more easily now so that if things suck suck where we live we don't have to put up with it we can go and try and move somewhere else it's a natural human like I've done that myself I've moved to a place in the UK that would be better for my kids that would give better um, opportunities for my children, right? So I have done an internal migration just by moving different boroughs um, for, for, for a scare quotes better life, right? So it's a, it's a totally natural human thing. People are going to want to move around the world. There are, there's, there's an ever-growing population at the moment, and there's going to be a very 
there's going to be an awful lot of pressure, increased pressure on nations with regard to people wanting to move to places that are more temperate, uh, that don't have climate catastrophes like hurricanes, for example, uh, that will draw on resources. And, you know, we need to work this out without stigmatizing and we need to work it out as compassionately as possible. I don't know if that can be done. Um, how how do we manage these global issues? Um, and we need to be very wary that, that tagged along with those global issues will come a whole bunch of, or, or that particular issue of migration will, will come an awful lot of other uh, scary nonsense that you see on the agendas of all these parties I've just been talking about. So, you know, just be warned. This is this is a challenging time in human history. Uh, but I guess I'm I'm here with you. So I'll keep reporting it. Take care, guys. Speak soon.